Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. I've got a really exciting talk for you to listen to today. Um, every year, um, it becomes increasingly difficult to decide upon the drug discovery of the year. We start off with a massive long list of um, newly approved drugs, and we try and whittle that down. We're looking for things where we know the mode of action. It's a first in class or a significant improvement on things that are already available, and that we can understand the translation from the preclinical species through to man. What we then do is whittle that down to three, three candidates, and we ask people to come in, give the industry subcommittee an overview of those, those candidates, and then we have a vote. And as I say, year upon year, it becomes increasingly difficult. I think you'll agree that Ristiplan is a very, very worthy candidate for the Drug Discovery of the Year 2022. It treats spinal muscular atrophy, which is a very severe and progressive disease. And you can see it actually can be life-threatening. Um, Lutz here is um, to here to tell us all about the drug. And he's very, very passionate about it. And I know he could talk for hours and hours. Lutz began uh, his career in genetic toxicology when he worked on his uh, diploma in biology in 1981. By 1989, he was the head of department, or head of the Department of Mutagenesis and Carcinogenesis at the Federal Institute for Drugs and Medical Devices in Berlin. From there, he moved in, into industry, initially in Novartis in 2000, where he um, created a group of entrepreneurs working on in silico safety and metabolism. Thereafter, he moved on to work for Hoffman La Roche, where he still resides. Initially, he was a toxicology project leader, but he's increased his expertise over the years. He's worked on small molecules, antisense modalities, biologics, vector-based gene therapy, all sorts of different um, modalities. And he's also worked across different therapy areas. So he's worked in neuroscience, ophthalmology, and rare diseases. He's a very, very interesting guy to talk to and he's very, very passionate about this drug. I'll hand over to Lutz because I know he could talk forever about this. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as an introduction, I just wanted to thank the BPS for giving a large team at Roche and our cooperation partners, PTC and the SMA Foundation, this award for a drug that we consider really a breakthrough uh, in terms of patient treatment and the mitigation of some sequelae of the disease, of this really very severe disease, starting at the start of life, um, called spinal muscular atrophy. So I am standing here on behalf of a large team of each of these cooperation partners and trying to deliver to you a little bit like also not like, you know, the technical details and the scientific background, but also a little bit of the emotional side that comes along with such a successful drug development and also being a little bit like the first one who was able, or the, you know, Roche was able to really be the first one to achieve improvement of a new class of mRNA splice modifiers as a small molecule, something I guess 10 years ago would have nobody had ever dreamed about that this would be actually really possible to do that safely with a small molecule. And so therefore here I'm standing like, you know, about 10 years after we have started this cooperation between PTC, the SMA Foundation, and Roche in order to achieve this breakthrough uh, medicine. And we have now seen the first approval of this medicine by the FDA about two years ago. And of yesterday, I have been told that uh, with approval in Mexico, we have, in the meantime, 90 countries in which this medicine is approved. Um, so therefore, I'm you know, very happy to 
be here and receive that award on behalf of the whole team that worked all these years feverishly in order to actually um, give this medicine to patients and give people with myelomuscular atrophy a chance for you know spending a better life than without any treatment. Um, when I'm talking about spinal muscular atrophy um, and being this being a relatively common rare disease with you know about a one in thirty to one in fifty thousand newborns carrying this disease around the world with about equal distribution around the world, we are talking about a deficiency in a protein called SMN, the survival of the motor neuron protein. And uh, as we all sit here in the room, we have two functional genes actually actively producing that type of protein. And one is, and that is delivering actually the majority of protein that we need, is done by the SMN1 gene. That is our main gene that is actually giving this active protein and releasing it. And the main function when we are getting older is that it actually allows the motor neurons to innovate and build the end planes to our muscles in order to achieve muscle function. Now, only humans, nobody, no other animal species has a second gene somehow evolved in evolution by chance. It's called the SMN2 gene. That SMN2 gene by mistake and because of a single point mutation is inserting a weak splice site. And therefore, this SMN2 gene, once transcribed into mRNA, very frequently in this splice machinery procedure that actually kicks out and regroups exons, introns, and all of that to actually have the final product available that would be transcribed in the protein translated, kicks out exon 7. So therefore, most of the output of the SMN2 gene is actually landing in a dysfunctional protein. Only little output of the SMN2 gene is actually doing a little bit of functional protein. Now, when speaking about um, the disease status, i.e. when the SMN1 gene is mutated and not functional anymore, we have people with SMA. And this is basically due to the loss of function of the SMN1 gene and the presence and facilitating still survival because of the little output of the SMN2 gene. What is actually then happening or what is actually observed in the population is that we have different gradings of the spinal muscular atrophy. And here is the clinical type of definition, type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4 SMA. And this is, a, you know, their life expectancy in general when untreated. Type 1 SMA babies usually die within two years of age and less than two years of age. Type 4 SMA patients may have a normal lifespan, but very much reduced ability to actually use their muscles. What is very clear is that there is a very clear cor a correlation between the severity of the disease and the numbers of the copies of this SMN2 gene that each of the individual patients has. And as I said, like, one copy is actually making a little bit of functional protein. If you have only one copy, type 1 SMA, you hardly survive on the little, very little um, functional protein that is made. If you have happen to have four copies, there's more functional protein made, facilitating better survival and less disease complications. 
Now, what we worked for is to try to tweak this splicing machinery with a small molecule a splice modifier. And yes, there is still a future for small molecules. It's not all antisense, it's not all antibodies, it's not all gene therapy nowadays. There is this world of small molecules which basically because of its unlimited combinations still allow a lot of potential new drugs. What is very specific with SMN with the Ristiplan molecule is that because of the nature of the target, that nature of the target and interrogation of the target displacing machinery required a certain kind of conditions of a structure that would violate quite a lot of kind of normal drug development rules. So what we have is we have no halogens attached to our molecule. It's based on a conjugated ring system. It is a flat molecule, and it show high, shows high biodistribution. And we'll come later back to that. Why is this important? And it shows quite high specificity for the SMP2 splicing target. And also, like in the next slide, I'll pay better back to that. But some of us actually who may be medicinal chemistry or among of us said, well, this is not a drug-like molecule. Yes, it is not a drug-like molecule. Still, nevertheless, it is a perfectly working and safe medicine. So sometimes you have to endure a journey and work against all odds to actually be able to see and materialize this as a drug. So there is a chance, but you have to know what you are doing, what kind of you know, hurdles you encounter with that. One of the hurdles, for instance, with such a small molecule, that a flat molecule, it's working via totally different metabolism systems than you normally go when you work, when you create a drug. Now, what, what is the specificity around that? When you, you know, imagine the splicing machinery, and this, you may know that most of our genes are actually alternatively spliced. And these alternative splice variants may have totally different biological functions. If you interfere with this splicing machinery, you may interfere with a lot of genes. And therefore, one of the objectives of creating Ristiplan was actually to try to actually work out the specificity that we would touch as few other genes in terms of splicing as possible, but acknowledging that a total elimination of this touching other genes would not be achievable. And there, our second uh, AIM came into with PK characteristics of tissue availability, tissue present penetration, volume of distribution. We tweak the safety of Ristiplam in a way that it opened us the window of opportunity on a very small safety margin approach to create a safe medicines for babies and toddlers and um, young adults as well as adults with SMA. So eventually we landed at selecting Ristiplam, not necessarily by design, but also there was some luck and some intuition that we did not really create specificity only for the interaction with the main target site, the five prime and slide site, of the spliceosome, but also with a second target in the splicing machinery, the exonic splicing enhancer site. And binding for both of these sites results in enhanced one's NERP affinity to the site which increases the efficiency of exon 7 inclusion, is resulting in higher selectivity of for the SMN2 pre-mRNA over other genes, 
and it actually massively increases the production of full-length SMN2 mRNA, and that, that is the requirement of redirecting the SMN2 gene output to, a fully, to create a fully functional protein. Now, not, I mean, no, none of the journeys in drug development are journeys without any bumps. Um, when we first had our inter first interaction with PTC, the original company who actually worked on the first templates and selected the first compounds, we realized that these were not developable because of multiple types of toxicities. And we created a compound named RG7800 at the time, which was our first novel SMN2 splicing modifier, which we actually then put into clinical trials already, and where we had been able to show an increased SMN2 protein levels in patients with SMA up to twofold. So that was our you know, first convincing result that this may work. However, you know, being here and standing as a toxicologist, and I don't know why I choose this path in life, basically because it actually then means that sometimes you have to communicate results that are disappointing and lead to a discontinuation of certain drug development activities. And this happened to me and the project and the team, in this case with RG7800, because we discovered then in a chronic toxicity study with monkeys that we had actually photoreceptor degeneration. And that is obviously something which you don't really want, even if it's a life-saving medicine. So there we were, and we had at the same time realized that RG7800 was for other reasons also not really an ideal molecule because it was phototoxic, it was Herc channel active, and whatever, you name it. But we nevertheless tried to actually see whether we would have a development window, but the, you know, the photoreceptor problem in monkeys was really one that was right a huge hurdle. However, we realized that with novel imaging technology, such as optical coherence tomography, you can actually look into the back of the eyes of the animals, as you can do in humans, and you can judge and online measure whether a photoreceptor issue is building up, whether the retina reacts to the treatment with the splice modifier, and therefore we integrated this kind of monitoring system into the toxicology studies with Ristiplam and said, yes, we can do that, and here is a window of opportunity because at low doses, which may be fully therapeutically active, there is no photoreceptor damage, only at relatively high doses above what we want to test therapeutically, there is this photoreceptor damage. But we can also watch online, inpatient, treated with Ristiplam, whether such effects would be developing or not. But the challenge was obviously also we had in our clinical trials in babies. How do you do with optical coherence monitoring in babies, which is not really very easy because they actually do, you have to actually be, have really keep still and it's not really easy to sedate babies to actually <laughs> allow for this optical coherence tomography. So quite huge challenges. But that's what we did there for Ristiplam to allow its development. Another, you know, I shortly elaborated on that, this specificity of splice modification was a key optimization goal, of course, for us. And here is one of our earlier publications that actually looked at SMN33, this is like equivalent to Ristiplam at the time, and another RNA splice modifier that happened to come from the other big company across the Rhine in Basel. And what you can see is that we actually looked into patient cells and looked for genes that are alternatively spliced with either Ristiplam-like molecule or this other molecule, 
and looked into which, you know, what was the extent of splicing affected by, from other genes, as well as overall transcript changes. And as you can see that at equimolar potent concentrations, you see a much higher specificity of Ristiplama-like compound versus the other compound. Now that was kind of very reassuring that we had this kind of additional splice site uh, specificity interference, which apparently was not given for the other compound. We did not make this by design, but it was somehow as a result of the whole optimization machinery in which we also looked like a global splice site analysis whether we can increase specificity. Nevertheless, it doesn't, may not really matter for toxicology sometimes because still in these few alternatively spliced off targets, there may be very important ones which are super critical for safety evaluation. And yes, there are. And RISD-PLAM still has alternative splice sites. One is a cell cycle regulation gene and another one is a apoptosis related gene which kicks in at super therapeutical doses and exposures, so we are not very more, more worried so much anymore about these kind of safety implications. And as you can later see, our clinical data really confirm that. But it still has some uh, side, side uh, effects, at least in non-clinical studies. And these are the two ones here, FOXM1 and MADD. This is a cell cycle gene, and MADD is a apoptosis-related gene. So what actually happens here with FOXM1, there is this inclusion of exon 9 in FOXM1, and that makes out of FOXM1, which is otherwise a cell cycle factor that propels the cell cycle to go through, into a protein that actually stops the cell cycle, the inclusion of exon 9 in that transcript. And for MADD, we have the inclusion of sec exon 20, which makes the MADD output, as alternative spliced output, an apoptosis-related gene and propels apoptosis. So these were the side effects that we were like really deeply investigating in animal studies, and we see lots of those related toxicological effects to, related to these two off genes, such as epithelial changes on the skin and the GI tract, bone marrow mucus induction, and all these types of things, but all with a defined mechanism of action, an understandable mechanism of action, and with a therapeutic window. Now, a little bit, a little bit like more elaboration on the SMN2 gene and the protein. And why we selected actually Ristiplam as a compound, and you will later see what the potential advantage of that is, is that we actually designed Ristiplam as an agent that doesn't only penetrate the central nervous system upon oral dosing, but also distributes throughout the body more or less evenly. Because we recognized, although the SMA clinical feature is mainly a feature of muscular neuronal junction problems, but as the body produces SMN protein in almost all cells of the body, it is intuitive and very obvious, and also other data point towards that, that there are other aspects of the disease which are not treated so far, which are important to be corrected, not only the facilitation of the neuromuscular junction. So in preclinical studies, we have demonstrated similar total drug levels in plasma, muscle, and brain, in parallel dose dependent increasing in SMN proteins levels are observed in brain and muscle and Ristiplam teetered mouse models. And this is very important because we see these types of effects in plasma and the monocytes in the plasma actually produce SMN. We can actually really see in patients in their plasma 
an increase in functional protein. And that increase in functional protein in the plasma is reflected because Ristiplam distributes evenly through all tissues. And we have seen that in monkeys, we have seen that in rats, we have seen that in mice. We can conclude that this is true for humans and therefore when we can actually select the dose that is supposed to be effective, we can select that based on the increase of protein that we see in plasma of patients. So and here's actually what this is, what this actually means. Here we have the survival data and body ga weight gain in Delta-7 mice. That is actually the genetically engineered mouse model for the human SMN2 gene. And you see with the treatment of a spice modifier like Ristiplam, we see at relatively decent doses here that we have a huge survival benefit um, as opposed to non-treated animals that would usually die after a few days after birth. In the meantime, we have data that mice can live like for half a year or even a year when treated with such an effective splice modifier. Otherwise, they would die like about, you know, maximum like 20 days after birth. And here are the correlated increase in protein levels in SMN that would facilitate this mitigation of the clinical status. And here is the correlation of SMN protein compared to the baseline in our clinical trials in the plasma. So we were very sure about this translational model and the protein that was increased in the plasma of our patients that you know, if this is not materializing in something valuable in the clinic and mitigation of aspects of the disease, we are all wrong in drug development. So if that would not work, we can discontinue our drops, I guess. So this was our hypothesis, and it really materialized. Of course, with all the safety concerns that we had also proceeding into testing Ristiplam in babies, the unknown metabolism pathways, the unknown expression of this metabolism pathways in babies, we started relatively low in babies, and we had a little bit higher um, those levels where we started with in the older patients, and these are the trials reflecting like here the babies, firefish and sunfish in the, young, in the older, younger patients, and monitored the various aspects of safety in clinical trials, such as the optical coherence tomography that we integrated in our patient trials in order to show that our non-clinical hypothesis, we have a NOL for retinal changes, a NOL for um, photoreceptor degeneration, that this NOL translates into the clinical safety. And in the meantime, since we are now three years into clinical development, uh, three years into treatment of patients, we are pretty sure that the safety actually really prevails and we have done the right thing. Here is the clinical biomarker response data from the various studies that we actually conducted. And these are three different types of studies in the very young patient population, in the little bit older patient population. And these are the trials that we are currently conducting where we have all comers, like those even treated previously with other types of interventions, such as Cholgensma with gene therapy or even with nucinersin. All of them respond over a very long period of time of one year with the presence of higher levels of protein in their, in their, in their blood, and the effect doesn't seem to go away. Maybe a notion about the naming of these studies. Roche has a strategy of going into due diligences with a certain code name. And this original due diligence with the 
partners PTC and the SENA Foundation was called Finding Nemo. And this is where the fish kind of theme for clinical trials emerged from. Now, this is a little bit like development journey. About 11 years ago, we have actually started this collaboration with PTC Therapeutics and the SMA Foundation. The clinical phase one safety trial with a single dose of Ristiplam in order to really confirm in healthy volunteers' blood this increase of full length transcript, not the protein, because in healthy volunteers, our protein is driven by SMN1. But you can measure the inclusion of exon 7 in the transcript of SMN2 in healthy volunteers. And we measured that and titrated the dose in healthy volunteers so high up that we had full inclusion of exon 7 into the SMN2 transcript, and that was the dose that we actually choose to go into patients with. In October 2016, the trial in types 2 and type, S, type 3 SMA begins. And then in December, a few months later, we started the trial in the babies. Now look at that. August 2020, less than four years later, we had approval by the FDA. Everybody who is now here involved in drug development knows that this can probably hardly be beaten anymore. Even oncology projects don't go that fast. So I guess the whole team is super proud of that, extremely fast and good recognition by health authorities in the approval of Ristiplam. That only leaves me personally with the disappointment that I had to tell the team to discontinue the previous compound. Because if the previous compound, the RG7800, would have been developed fully, we would have been probably two or three years earlier with approval. Yeah, so this is sometimes you have disappointing, sometimes you have you know, the more Supportive uh, stories in drug development all fits together in the end if you are successful and then you are standing here and reporting on the success story. <laughs> so that is super nice. <laughs> uh, but there were like really ups and downs in the whole story. In the meantime, we are approved by the FDA here in May for uh, babies of less than two months old. And of course, there is, people are now having the idea, okay, if you know that the mother who may be pregnant with a baby that carries the disease, is this a possibility to even actually treat it transplacentally? So that may be something that comes into the future. So what is important in this whole context in the Firefly study, 91% of the patients are alive after, say, 36 months of treatment. They usually, without any treatment, they are dead. Infants gain motor milestones, sitting independently, standing with resort, improvement in motor functions, the rate of hospitalization treated decreased over time. The majority of interns maintain the ability to swallow and feed orally. Very important, for, of course, for the parents. In the sunfish, the older patients, and that's critical because when you lose the ability of the motor neurons to innervate the muscles, they may have died and then do not regain them, but apparently they are, at least partly. So in older patients, we see that gain of motor function is stable over time and about a third of 36 months, as opposed to the natural history. 97% of patients consider stabilization of the disease to be really a progress because otherwise they witness going down constantly. What is very important also is this kind of real world evidence nowadays. Um, and uh, there are these aspects of milestones, regulatory relevant, 
primary objectives for clinical trials on, which, on the basis of which you get approval. But of course, what is important for the patients are more real life and more subtle kind of abilities, such as self-feeding, washing independently, performing transfers alone, self-toileting, dressing alone, engagement in social activities. So we have created such a program to actually measure all these types of aspects in the clinical setting, as, an, as called SMA's OM, which is a patient and caregiver reported outcome of measure for individuals with SMA. And of course, maybe not of course, but you know, having witnessed the development of risk diploma, I'm pretty confident it will continue to deliver. Patients report much better outcome as opposed to non-treated ones in all of these aspects. What is also important is safety, of course. And in this context, I guess there's almost no drug that you can actually say when you initially look at the safety and see this type of you know, event, and then you realize with longer treatment times, it apparently gets safer. So the, in the wide open, it seems it's kind of odd, right, for normal, you know, in drug development where when you put it into the market, you get all these side effects problems and all of that doesn't seem to be the case. So with time, and I didn't sleep for quite a while when babies were first treated, um, with time we got more and more confident that this drug is pretty safe for SMA patients. Well, we have been, I mean, this has been before a bit criticized that maybe large drug development companies are not too transparent in terms of how they publish about their drug development processes and the characteristics here. I guess in this case, risk Plan, we have widely published. We have you know, published in several peer-reviewed journals, in high-impact journals is recognized by experts. So I guess the team has done a very good job in order to you know, transparently not only you know, communicate the efficacy, but also the drug development, the safety, potential safety challenges for risk diploma. Uh, in the end of my talk, I just wanted to also maybe a little bit like make the excursion acknowledging that I think over the last 10 years or so, me personally and many, many people also working in this area and on the treatment of this disease have witnessed kind of a new era in medicine. Because at the same time, other companies were working for a treatment of SMA, and you probably know Nusi Nursin, and the market named Spinraza as an intrathecally injected antisense molecule originating from Ionis and uh, Biogen. Um, you know the AAV-based gene therapy so Gensma, originating from Avexis, and then Avexis was bought by Vinovartis, and now many of the newborn patients are treated with so Gensma, an AV-based gene therapy. And we have to match with these two types of novel therapies, our novel is Ristiplam, the small molecule RNA splice modifier. I think we can say really with confidence it has never happened in history of drug development that these, totally, these three totally fundamentally different modalities were developed about all of them almost in record time to actually treat the same disease, to go to the roots of this genetic disease. And therefore the industry that is criticized and so many different aspects has 
tried and has delivered over the last 10 years three novel medicines to treat this severe genetic disease with a quite high prevalence and successfully to actually transform this disease into a possibly manageable chronic disease and with more combination treatments maybe ahead of us that may be really the case for the patients affected with SMA. So I guess overall, I really want to appreciate that the BPS gives this drug, or has given this drug, the drug of discovery of the year award. Um, Ristiplam is available for patients with SMA worldwide. We have I'm representing the company Roche as a toxicologist. Maybe it's also a bit unusual that as a toxicologist gives this, you know, the, the award lecture. But this is the motto of the company. And exactly that motto, doing now what patients need next, is, would be really, is really applicable to this case. Um, I thank you. I thank the BPS for having given the team the award. Um, I thank you for listening, and if there is still some time, I don't know, I can actually then try to also answer questions. Um, you may have gotten the in impression that I could actually talk for hours about Listipalm. Um, um, also potentially could write books out of it, and maybe it's just you know time to also end my career with it, but there are other you know, interesting things in drug development going on, and Russia has a big portfolio and other challenges ahead, even for a toxicologist, and also still uh, possibilities for rescue and giving patients, you know, options for their diseases to mitigate them. Thank you. Thank you, Lutz, for a very entertaining talk there. Any questions in the audience? And it's very difficult to see from here. Um, there's someone at the microphone there. Um, Abdel Majid uh, from uh, uh, Libya, a uh, PhD researcher. Um, as a pharmacist, my question is regarding, to, uh, regarding the price of this uh, drug. The price is very high, and is, as you know, it's not accessible for um, many poor patients around the world. Do you think the, um, the, f the first question is why the price is very high? And do you think in the near future will be much uh, cheaper? And another question is about the, do you think Roche company will give the permission to another pharmaceutical company, companies around the world to make this drug more available? Well, you know, you're putting me in a difficult position because, you know, thankfully as a toxicologist, I don't need to make pricing decisions. Um, the strategy of Roche is that, of course, we are asking for a price that represents the value for the patients of the medicine. And also, we compare with what the other two drugs that are available. Uh, we also have extensive programs to support treatment with Ristiplam of people who may not be able to afford it. But of course, you know, I'm standing here as a toxicologist, I'm probably not the right one to actually thoroughly discuss, you know, pricing and reimbursement and health authority, pricing negotiations for this drug. Excellent talk. I may have missed the beginning because I was giving a talk myself earlier. Um, you mentioned in utero treatment. Um, so do you have any ideas about the timelines when this is going to be possible? And have you done in utero treatment in animals? Yes, an utero treatment in animals has been done with a small molecule SMA splice modifier. 
and knowing the course of the disease and when it starts actually in embryonal development, it is absolutely intuitive to postulate not only after birth, but that it would be actually probably even more helpful if you would start already in utero. Now, as you may know, we have these off targets like cell cycle and apoptosis related target, which of course leads to a label that has implications in terms of potential issues with teratogenicity, embryonal toxicity that interferes with this kind of potential approach. But when you look at what is available in terms of nusinersen, Zeugensma, and Ristiplam, you realize that only one of those three can potentially be used in this context. I'm just saying that this is, this is the range in which we are working right now. And I cannot say anything about when we, when there would be potentially, you know, a clinical program in this regard, because that has huge also safety implications potentially. Yeah. But of course, it is intuitive that this is something disease-wise and scientifically that is logical to pursue if, me, if you ask me as a scientist. Yeah. and not as a company person. <laughs> Thank you. So one more question from me. Um, you mentioned the speed with which you went from first time in man through to approval, which is incredible. Is there any advice you could give to others around that, or was it just luck? Well, one of the preconditions, of course, for the speed was that, at least in babies, we have a very clear de defined and not debated milestone, such as babies sitting. You know, after, you know, when they are six months old and you have started treatment early enough, you can see whether they sit independently for a few seconds. And that was our, what our, clearly our milestone. And therefore, you know, it's a non-negotiable. This is so clear and evident that it is so convincing for health authorities and we had also the precedence, of course, with Lucy Nursen before, that, you know, that was a little bit like a no-brainer. I mean, that's a positive aspect of the whole development that facilitated the fast development. It's not possible in many other diseases, but it certainly really helped. And what also really helped is regarding the dose setting, the evidence and all of that, the correlation with the biomarker, the clear evidence for tissue distribution, that the dose selection was optimal, that we didn't really miss kind of an optimal dose for the clinical setting and all of that. So in all of that contributed to the fast development. All right, brilliant. Thank you, Lutz.